Hi there, I'm, uh, I'm Sadie Crabtree. I'm the communications director of the JREF. Could I, uh, could I get the slides up? Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm Sadie Crabtree, and if you want to tweet this talk with the TAM9 hashtag, uh, I'm still Sadie Crabtree. Uh, I want to start this talk today by telling you about an email I got a couple of months ago from someone I met on Randy's speaking tour in Norway. This gentleman was asking a very serious question, and he wanted to know if we could give him advice. It was a tough question, and it took me a long time to figure out what to say to him. What he asked was, how can I best help spread the message and help people change their minds and join the side of reason? Every time I try, he said, I hit these obstacles. Uh, people are afraid of leaving their alternative views because they get meaning and comfort from them. It looks like we have nothing to replace uh, the, you know, the, the emptiness that they filled with pseudoscientific beliefs and nonsense. And I get accused of uh, fanatically preaching another religion, that science is just another dogma. And I don't feel like I have the expertise I need to advocate for the cause. This last one is not true at all, by the way. This guy's a PhD. He's more prepared than most. To people to argue for a rational, naturalistic point of view. But he's frustrated because he, feel, he feels like he's not winning these arguments. The frustration he's feeling, I think, is because he's trying to get people to accept reason by trying to reason with people who don't yet accept reason. And I think we've all had the experience of arguing with someone until you're blue in the face, uh, even though your arguments are strong and theirs are very weak, or maybe don't even exist. Uh, they just won't listen to reason and you can't figure out why. Well, Here's why. They don't listen to reason. That's not, that's not the language they speak. Uh, trying to argue people into being more reasonable is a little like trying to convince a student of literature that mathematics is a better field while using only mathematical proofs to make your point. Uh, you're just not speaking their language. Uh, so to put this another way, reason is a fantastic tool for making great decisions. Uh, but we can't rely on it for changing minds. We know that. Because if simply being logically correct made an idea persuasive, there would be no wrong ideas left in the world. And they're everywhere. So how can we ever win with these people? I'm a skeptic, and uh, I'm an atheist. But my background is not in religion or in science or uh, in education. So I'm not going to approach this from any of those perspectives. My background is in strategic communications, uh, which is really the art and science of this question. How do we win? If you're trying to get a law passed, if you're trying to get a corporation to change its behavior, you're trying to help workers form a union uh, or win a union election, you're trying to spark a revolution, it, the words that you choose and the values that you communicate will often determine whether you win or lose. And you want to choose those words very carefully and deliberately and not leave it to chance. Uh, and the words that we're using and that we're used to using may not be doing what we think they're doing. So I want to talk about advancing science and critical thinking within that framework. Uh, I don't have the answer to how do we win. I don't believe there is one answer, but there are fixed questions that will get us there. And that's what I want to give you to think about today. These are the questions that are at the center of any strategic communications plan. We ask, what's the goal? What are we trying to accomplish? Who do we need to talk to to accomplish that goal? What do we want them to do? What are we actually asking? What values do they hold that we can tap into? And what beliefs do they hold that will be obstacles to us getting through to them? And finally, based on those, our answers to those questions, what do we say? And who says it? Who, who is trusted to deliver the message? So first, what's our goal? Skeptics have a lot of different goals. Uh, and your tactics will be different depending on what you choose as your goal. We might one day want to mobilize public support to defeat an anti-science education bill. Or we might want to energize and recruit people to uh, to join our organizations who already consider themselves to be skeptics. But the question this talk is, uh, is about is how to persuade more people to have a naturalistic scientific worldview and fewer people to subscribe to supernatural and pseudoscientific beliefs. If we can figure out how to do that consistently, it's only a matter of time before we will control the entire world. <laughs> so now we've got our goal. The next question is who do we need to talk to? In grassroots organizing, when you're mobilizing a lot of people to take action on an issue, you divide them up into three basic groups. Um, you know, the people who support us already, the people who are firmly opposed to what we're doing, and the people who don't feel so strongly that their views are fixed. Uh, and the most important group that we want to talk to, if we really want to make more skeptics in the world, 
is the people who've, whose views aren't firmly fixed, because our time and money are limited resources. When we're talking to each other or arguing in circles with entrenched opponents, we're not changing minds and we're not moving closer to our goal. If you want to change as many minds as you can, you should be spending most of your time talking to those people who are persuadable. Um, obviously, we also need to talk to people who support us. A main reason is that we need to keep them energized, we need to get them involved in our organization so that they too can go out and talk to people who, uh, who, who are, are persuadable. Um, but the goal here is to change minds and not only to find the people who already agree with you. That can feel like progress, but on the outside, uh, in, on, from the external view, we're not actually gaining ground. It's also tempting to argue with people who are dead set against your goals and your worldview. It, it can make sense. Uh, it, it's, it's fun because we, we're skeptics. We like, uh, you know, we like to argue. We like logical fallacies, and we like pointing out when someone else does it. Uh, but unless people in that persuadable middle are listening and it's having an effect on them, uh, it's, it's, it's not effective. Uh, and th that's a rare situation when that happens. It does happen. Um, but I've seen canvassers on a petition drive, for example, argue with an opponent who is very entrenched for 10 minutes, and during that time, 100 people who've walked past who probably would have signed the petition. Um, and the other side does this very well. Mormons, for example, will stop knocking on your door if you tell them that you're a Catholic or an atheist, because millions of door knocks have told them that they are not able, you know, except in an extreme minority of cases, to turn Catholics or atheists into Mormons. And they've got billions of dollars to spend on proselytizing, and they've got an army of conscripted foot soldiers, but uh, they still want to spend those resources wisely. So the next question is, Uh, the next question is, what do we want people to do when they hear from us? In a political election, this is very simple. We want them to vote for our candidate. Uh, in a grassroots campaign, we might be trying to get people to sign a boycott, or to sign a petition or join a boycott. We may not have, right now, in this talk, a concrete action in mind for skepticism. But I, I bring this up to say that strategic communications uh, most often focuses on changing people's behavior and what they do, rather than changing their values and how they think. Uh, because it's very easy to change behavior and it's almost impossible to change someone's values. It's very difficult. For example, people tend to uh, oppose tax increases and vote against them. And if you want someone to vote for a tax increase, you don't try to convince them that tax increases are good. You tell them that the tax increase is going to fix the potholes on their street. So you don't have to convince them you know, to give up their belief that tax increases are bad uh, and not to hate tax increases. They just have to hate potholes more. So, you start with what they care about, and you give them reasons that matter to them. Uh, and they may, not, may or may not be reasons that matter to you, uh, but they're reasons that are true, and but they're matter, reasons that appeal to them. If, you, if workers at a hospital are going on strike, and you want the community around the hospital to support the strike, uh, you, you don't talk about how strikes are the most important tool uh, that workers have to level the playing field with their employers, right? You, you talk about how the nurses are fighting for better staffing levels so that when patients go to the hospital, they know there's enough staff there to take care of them. Uh, and, and both of these things are true, but you get to decide what you talk about. And you don't have to get the public to support the idea of a strike. You just have to get them to support this strike. Uh, so, so what's the point of this is if what we really want to do is change hearts and minds and not just change behavior. Um, the thing is that changing behavior does change minds. And it's one of the most effective things in changing minds because it sets up a cognitive dissonance. And once you voted for one tax increase, it gets harder to maintain the belief that all tax increases are bad. And once you supported striking workers on a picket line, it gets harder to maintain the idea that union workers are lazy and selfish, right? Um, so what does this mean for skeptics? It means that if we are uh, trying to get superstitious people to think more critically, there is value in getting them to use scientific thinking in small ways that don't require them to give up their entire worldview and self-identity to do so. Um, so, so the question that uh, this gentleman emailed me, you know, w was saying that he had people in his family, people that he, you know, really strongly wanted to convince, and, and it hurt him to think about them being consumed by these, uh, you know, uh, fallacies and, and these, these superstitions. Um, and, and so however much we want to focus on these pers the most persuadable people, many of us have people like that in our lives. And what I said to him is, is that when it seems like someone believes in every ridiculous thing, from homeopathy to guardian angels, it can be, the, the instinct is to say, your whole worldview is screwed up. Everything you think is wrong. Like, the way you're approaching this is wrong. 
And that tends to make people dig in their heels because people's identity is wrapped up in their worldview, the way people think about themselves. And you're asking people to give up a huge part of themselves uh, in order to do that. So it may be better to accept that we can't change pe the entirety of people, who, who people are overnight. Um, back off for a while, and in this particular situation, instead present them with small individual examples of how scientific thinking can, uh, can, can help them and is useful. If they're into homeopathy and they swear it works for them, if you come at them and say, it's, it's all in your head, it's a placebo, they, they hear that as, you're crazy. Like, what you say is not, you don't know what you're experiencing. And that makes people very defensive. So find something they haven't used yet. Tell them, the, you know, tell them that you uh, saw the video, a video on ear candling that proved that it was, it was fake. You know? uh, tell them about the power bands where the, uh, the, the manufacturer has admitted that there's no evidence whatsoever that they work. And you can demonstrate the way uh, that, you know, that it's made to appear to have an effect. Help them, feel, help them use scientific thinking to feel smarter than their friends instead of make, using it to make them feel stupid. And, uh, you, you give them a positive experience with critical thinking, and the next time you come back to them to talk about this issue, you will have some common ground to start from. And it's a long-term process. It's not as satisfying as winning a debate, but it's more likely to change the way people actually think if they're truly dug in. So, back to the slide. Okay. Um, so our strategic questions about uh, our strategic questions about those in the middle and uh, who are more persuadable. To get people to do what you want to, them to do, you have to talk to them in terms of their own values and their own needs. Um, it doesn't mean pandering to people's worst views and ideas. It means working with values we share. Uh, and you also have to look at the beliefs that they hold, which will be obstacles, um, things so you can figure out how to get past them. And I want to show just a few examples uh, of some widely held values we can use to encourage reason and critical thinking. Honesty. People believe others should be honest and not mislead them. Uh, people believe others should not profit by breaking the rules. And people, people believe that th there is virtue in helping those that we care about and, and, and taking care of them. Uh, these are just a few examples. And here are some other things that people want, aspirations that they want for themselves that, uh, that can be useful to us as skeptics. People want to feel smart and respected. People want to feel right and confident in their decisions, and people don't want to feel cheated or taken advantage of. When we frame things in terms of these shared values, it can go a long way toward, uh, toward making our point with, with the general public who don't consider themselves skeptics. Um, so and if we don't play to these values and aspirations, it won't connect with the people we're talking to, and we need to spell it out as well and not just assume that people see the value of what we're offering. On the flip side, these are some obstacles. Um, there are needs and beliefs that act to stop people from listening to us at all. Um, we need that people have a, feel, a need to feel in control. They ha want to have some, something that makes sense of uh, an irrational and scary world for them. The, the fact that lightning can strike and you can die at any moment, you can lose your job and lose your health care and be on the street. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to deal with that without some sort of understanding of who's on the right side and who's on the wrong side in the world? Who, who's making the bad things happen? If you're going to take that from people, you need to offer them some understanding of the world that's a positive understanding of the world that helps them replace that. Um, next, people want to feel smart, right, and respected. Right? We, this is an opportunity as well. I just put this up um, as people's values. So, but it's on obstacles because sometimes skeptics do things that make people feel dumb, wrong, and disrespected. And when we do that, people aren't in a place to listen. Uh, and, and we make, can, can make people feel this way with the words we choose, even if we're not intending to. Another obstacle is people's negative views about skeptics. Um, and I'll explain why this is important in a minute, but some of the th views that people have about skeptics, that we're just uh, against everything and not for everything, that we're narrow-minded, we back the establishment, we're tied to big pharma, right? We, you know, we, we, uh, that the, we just s say what the, whatever the mainstream consensus is, and that's not always right. Um, and that we're elitists, we're arrogant, we think that we're smarter than everybody else, and we dismiss other people as stupid. These are the, some of the views that people may be inclined to hold against us when we first approach them. If we say, I'm a skeptic and I'd like to have a conversation with you. So, 
I'm not, I, want to, I want to give an example. I want to illustrate this. Um, because we're in, in, living in a time when we're constantly bombarded with conflicting information and ideas. In order to make sense of this, and in order to function, we have to instantly be able to sort things um, into whether or not we take them seriously or whether we don't. So I'm going to go through a couple of scenarios. So this is going to be an experiment. And tell me, uh, do you, if you were looking for a reputable uh, online pharmacy, do you trust what's on this web page? Wait. Do you trust what's on this web page? OK. Why? Um, would you read everything on this page before you decided whether or not this is reputable information or not? OK. Great. Uh, so is, is, this, is this good health information? Are you going to learn stuff from this video? Do you need to listen to the video to make up your mind? Or are you going to click play? Is this urgent? <laughs> it, says, it says it's urgent. Why, why, would you, why do you think it's not urgent? So it, it, the point is it doesn't matter what's in the envelope. It doesn't matter if the pharmacy reviews are real, if the video is actually announcing a real breakthrough in quantum physics. You saw something in each of those that looked typical of something untrustworthy, so it goes straight to your mental spam folder. Uh, and, and no matter how good the rest of the message is, you never see what's in that envelope. And everyone does this. We match new information with patterns we've seen before to figure out how we should interpret it. And how we think about a moral or ideological issue can be completely different based on what pattern we match that to. We have set ways of understanding the sides of an argument, the narratives, their stories that we've learned from society that we fit new conflicts into. You instantly know that that web page is a link farm because it just looks like one. Um, and, and we call these, these narratives frames. Um, so we have frames for talking about political conflicts, right? We have the little guy versus the establishment, the reformer versus beltway bureaucrats. We figure out when, when, we, when there's a, a race, like what's going on here? Like wh which guy is on which side? We have uh, frames for t thinking about science, mainstream credible science versus cranks, groundbreaking science versus the naysayers who told you know, the Wright brothers that we could never fly. Uh, and we have disturbing new findings versus a dismissive establishment, right? We've got uh, the guy in Independence Day who's decoded the message from the aliens and knows they're going to attack, but no one will listen. Uh, and, and these are stories that we learn from society. Um, and then we've got ways of thinking about economic issues, individual rights versus government authority or corporate greed versus public good. Uh, public service employees versus corporate lobbyists or struggling taxpayers versus greedy public employees. These are stories that uh, we f tend to fit conflicts into these boxes. Um, so the same person can come down on two very different sides of similar issues just because of the way the issues are framed. And that's why you don't want your ideas to be put in the wrong box. So for a second, uh, think about the anti-vaccination movement and what box we get put in or, or the, the, what box the pro-vaccine vaccine movement gets put in in this debate. The frame that anti-vaxxers are presenting to people is that of tool, scientists as tools of corporate interests, uh, which is a real thing that people understand. Because for years, people heard that scientists told us tobacco doesn't cause cancer. Uh, and finally, the public understanding of the, of the science caught up to what everyone already knew. Uh, and, and there are scientists now doing research for oil companies, saying there's no proof of global warming, and global warming can't be proved. So, it's this mistrust of corporate-driven science coupled with parents' fears about their children and feeling this huge responsibility to protect them uh, that, that drives this anti-vaccination panic. And when pro-vaccination skeptics respond with the facts, you know, uh, that, that vaccines are much safer than not vaccinating, what the public can hear is, trust the scientists. You know, they know better than you what's best for your children. And that's what people can hear. Uh, and as long as we're stuck in that frame with someone, we can't win with them because they put everything that we say into that box. And we ha so we have to get out of that box to give people a different way to understand the conflict. It also matters who delivers the message. Uh, you will be dismissed if you're perceived to have a self-interested motivation in, in saying what you're saying. If you're a spokesperson talking about your protest and people perceive that you are associated with an economic interest in, in the outcome of the conflict, um, people won't trust what you're saying. People trust union workers much more than they trust union officials, for example. People trust consumers more than they trust a corporate uh, spokesperson. Basically, people trust people with whom they feel they share common interests. Uh, and when people see you on TV, 
uh, even if they don't know who you are, they'll look at your clothes, your age, your tone of voice, uh, and, and a lot of other factors, so they can try to decide if you're on their side or if you're on someone else's side. Uh, and it's not necessarily who you are or whose side you're on that matters, it matters what people perceive. It's the public perception. So with everything we say, we're telling others something about ourselves. When we talk about the other side, we're also talking about us. When we say that the people on the other side are stupid, we're saying that we're know-it-alls and that we think we're really smart. When we say that uh, people are gullible uh, and need to learn critical thinking because they'll believe anything, we're saying that we think we're better than smarter than everyone. And if you make fun of dumb hillbillies in the Bible Belt, what you're communicating to a lot of people is that you're an elitist, coastal, coastal city-dwelling city dwelling liberal who does not care about what life is like for the majority of people in the country. So with the words we choose and how we talk about an issue, we're not just talking about our ideas, but we're communicating who we are. Uh, and it's not what you say that matters, it's what people think they hear. To, I want to illustrate this a bit. I can still remember the moment that I stopped uh, actively supporting John Kerry in the 2004 presidential election. And it was not anything that the opponent said, it wasn't anything that John Kerry said. It was an image in a Kerry fundraising email. Uh, and I'll show you this image. Look at the signature. I, I, find, this, I find this disgusting. Uh, I mean, it, it reeks of the, the snobbery of someone who's never worked a day in their life yet still feels their, import, their opinions are more important than everyone else's views. It, this, I see this and, and I, I think of a rich kid in high school who sat and practiced the signature for hours you know, until it fully reflected his own inflated opinion of himself and he was just convinced he'd finally gotten it right. This is gonna be my signature when I'm president. And this, this little hook, this little, the hook on the end of the K is like a visual representation of a sneer of superiority. And I, I, just, I, I find it just, it, it, it makes me angry to, to just to look at it. And this is complete, this may be completely irrational, uh, but this plays into all the bad things that people said about John Kerry. It, it, you know, he, he's a millionaire elitist who's out of touch with uh, ordinary Americans and looks down on everyone. But when I see that, I don't see someone I trust to defend my interests as president. I look at it and I can't get the taste out of my mouth. So I, I apologize if anyone is friends with John Kerry. Um, I don't know if this is an accurate picture of him at all. But the point is that it doesn't matter who John Kerry is, really, to his friends, because most voters aren't friends with him. We decide what we think of him based on the relatively small amount of information we have available, matched with patterns we've seen before, and the frames and narratives that we've learned. So I, I tell the story as an example of the things we say about ourselves without meaning to, or, or even seeing that we're doing it. To apply this to skepticism and critical thinking, uh, we have to think about the language we use with each other and the attitudes we share, and examine whether those are, are things that help or hurt us when we talk to the general public. Um, people's, uh, people's stereotypes of skeptics may not be fair, they may not be logical, but it doesn't matter. Perception is, is what matters when we're trying to persuade the public. Now, I know there's a lot of controversy around the right tone and the right words and the right approach that skeptics should use, so I want to be clear that I'm not saying we should be pushovers and not say anything mean. Uh, a lot of this is not about tone. It's about making sure that we are working with the values uh, and the shared values of the persuadable people we want to persuade instead of working against their values and against ourselves. When you speak to someone in the values they understand, you can take a much more aggressive tone and get away with it um, when they perceive that you're on their side. Uh, whereas if you attack their values, you'll be written off and you may even push them the other way. What I would say is that there is a cost associated with arguing in a certain way. Uh, and we need to do the math on it for different situations. In political communications, when a candidate runs a negative campaign or a negative ad, there's a cost to that. A certain number of people are going to be put off by attack ads. It costs you votes to do attack ads. Um, what you have to make sure when you do attack ads is that you're costing your opponent more votes than you're costing yourself. Uh, and that, that, that can work. Uh, but when you're going negative because it's the right decision for a specific situation, that's great. Just check to make sure your rationale makes sense. Uh, and if you, if you want to reach other people, use the words that are most likely to reach them instead of the words that are the most satisfying to say or the words that we're just most comfortable with because we, we, we use them with each other. Because it's not what you say that's important, it's what people hear. So how do we make sure that they hear what we really mean? Uh, first, prepare what we want to say ahead of time. Write down the ways that we want to express each idea and express them that way every time. Um, and then think twice about each word you're using. Once, to think about what it means to you. 
and then twice to think about what it means to the people who aren't skeptics, who don't understand skepticism, don't consider themselves to be in our, in our community, and aren't science literate. Um, if those meanings do not match, consider using different words. And I want to put up a few examples of words that we use a lot with each other. These are some words that we use a lot with each other um, and some thoughts that, on how they could sound to people outside the skeptical community. First, critical thinking. Um, I mean, for people that don't understand that that's a, you know, one concept, that the, people don't think being critical is being judgmental and mean. Uh, that's not so great. And e even when people understand what we mean by critical thinking, we're still telling people that they're not thinking critically when we say we want to encourage them to think critically. When you are arguing with a person uh, that you strongly disagree with and they tell you that I think your problem, why you're not getting this, is you're just not thinking critically, how does that make you feel? Angry, right? Like, like somebody just found some fancy words to call you an idiot. And so, so that's how it can be perceived when, when people hear us uh, saying these kind of things, when we describe our aims as encouraging people to think more critically. We're opening up the, this possibility that people interpret this as, as, an, as a kind of insult. Um, educate, the word educate. If someone you disagree with comes up and says, hi, would you like me to educate you so you'll agree with me? It, it's kind of an insult. You're saying that, you know, they're saying that you're not, you're not educated and if you only were more educated, you would agree with them. Um, maybe that's true. But it's, it's, it can be perceived as an insult, and it also is a word that makes the people we're reaching out to into passive recipients of what we're doing instead of full human beings with agency in the situation. And, and so people can feel insulted, if, uh, insulted by this. Um, the word vaccination, when, when I hear vaccination, I hear, think of a doctor coming after me with something sharp. Um, I think it, it, it hurts, right? And it's not a pretty word. And again, it's about something being done to me rather than something I'm doing for myself. So how about immunity, right? This is a word that everyone knows that immunity is great. It describes the benefit rather than the process. Plus, everyone knows that it's like the best thing to win on a reality show. Like, this is reinforced all the time that immunity is great. Nonsense, hogwash, woo-woo, gullible, suckers, credulous. Like, when we talk about this, we are, in a way, insulting the people that we want to reach. We are telling people that they, you know, don't... Uh, th these are words that we use as shorthand. Uh, nonsense, for example. What we mean when we say nonsense is things that have sh been shown to be false, generally. And if we say that, we are not... Uh, we're not insulting the people that believe in it. We're giving them a piece of information, right? And, and it goes a lot for farther toward explaining our point. And I want to make one point about jargon words and other words that are specific to a certain community. They almost always carry a different meaning outside the group than inside. Um, in the labor movement, unions have done research that shows huge differences in public support based on whether or not you use the word union uh, if you, or if you spell out what you really mean. If you ask people to support workers at the grocery store forming an organization where they can work together to raise their wages and win access to affordable health insurance, a lot of people support you. You get overwhelming support. If you ask people to support the grocery workers union, it plummets. Because people have all different ideas about what the word means, and they apply that to, to, to what you said. So if you, want to, uh, you know, if you want to be clear, the best way to have control over how the words are, are perceived is to say exactly what you mean. Um, so I'll, I'll just give a couple of examples of how this can, how this can improve. Um, for example, we often say we're here to educate the public about pseudoscientific nonsense or something like this. If we say we're here to help people defend themselves from pseudoscientific scams, we're giving people agency. We're helping you protect yourself. This is something, you know, protect yourself and your family. We're also, we're also putting the blame on the scammer and not on the person who believes it. If you want to go a step further with this, you can take out the jargon and say that we're, we want to defend people from scams that use scientific sounding language to mislead consumers instead of talking about pseudoscience. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to do these other um, pieces that we were going to do. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do, okay. Here's, okay, critical thinking. If we want to say we, we want people to think critically, an alternative is to say that we want to inspire an investigative truth-seeking spirit in others. We, we want people to understand that this is, that, that this is a, uh, 
this is a gift. This is this amazing thing. If we want to go totally off the rails with it, we can tell people why science is awesome, right? Like, this is what we're inspiring. This is about investigation. This is about, uh, you know, this is about, it's, it's about uh, positive things and not just about eliminating the negative things. Um, so these questions are, are useful. Um, and they're an effective way of organizing your thinking about how to communicate with the public. You may find them useful in thinking about other issues too. To sum up what I wrote to my friend in Norway about skepticism, here's what I think you should keep in mind if you want to gain ground against all the bad ideas out there and ultimately take over the world for skepticism. Don't rely on reason to reach, re reach the unreasonable. With folks you care about who are really stuck, try to move them one step at a time. Spend most of your time persuading the persuadable. Speak to people's own values and aspirations. Don't jump headfirst into someone's mental spam folder by me making your message look like trash. Think twice about words, not just what they mean to you, but the different meaning they have to others. And don't sign your name like John Kerry, because everything you say says who you are. Thank you, Sadie. Excellent. Sadie Crabtree, folks. I, I missed a little bit of that because I was practicing my signature, but um, I think it was, it sounded good, so yeah, cool.